This is the Ain't No Fang podcast with Arizona Sports. Welcome on a Tuesday, the kind of opening day eve of baseball, even though we were, our first game is at 3 o'clock in the morning in South Korea. <laughs> Not but. something that I think we're going to be catching, <laughs> unfortunately, but yeah, it's it's here, baby. Let's go. Speak for yourself. Uh, we're ab- <laughs> us fiends are absolutely staying up till 3 in the morning to watch baseball. <laughs> Alex Weiner and Mitch Vereldis is in studio today as we are going to break down the National League West, the division that keeps on giving us off-season content, thankfully, <laughs> compared to everybody else Ooh, in this dog. division yeah and uh even with opening day for everybody else less than 10 days away uh giant big ticket free agents are still coming to the national league west as in the words of tori lavello or i guess i'm paraphrasing here why does every big free agent coming to the nl west? <laughs> do they know that other divisions <laughs> exist i think is the response of many after last night so we are going to break down the five teams um sort of players to watch what to go over uh you know padres dodgers will kick things off and then we'll kind of uh, you know, I guess spring training continues for another week or so, and then we're getting into it on March 28th when the Diamondbacks play the Rockies. And uh, I guess since this is a Diamondbacks podcast, we should start mm-hmm. with some Diamondbacks sort of, uh, I, I guess, some news topics that have kind of broke out in the past week or so first. Let's hit it. Uh, speaking of the division, the Diamondbacks play the Rockies first, and uh, that man is going to be the opening day starter. That was announced last night. Zach right. Gallon versus Everybody Kyle make Freeland. Your, the scream face, as in like you're surprised that this announcement came down. No, I mean, we're it's, not surprised. It's funny. I mean, I, you know, it's one of like the classic, like before the season starts, we got to announce who the opening day starter course, is, no course. matter how obvious it is. And it's like just mapping out Gallon's spring tra- training starts. It's like perfect Gallon on day one, Kelly on day two, Erod on day three, and well, then you go on. Well, and- it's funny because I think this is this is one of the first times that we've actually been able to recognize what the rotation was before they even had pitchers and catchers mm-hmm. report, right? After they signed Eduardo Rodriguez, it felt clear that he was going to be in the three slot. Brandon Fott was going to be in the four, and then it was just a fight for whoever's going to fee- be the five, which we'll get into in a sec. But Gallon was very clearly going to be the guy that was kicking things off for the season for the second year in a row. I'm not sure it was that obvious that Erod was going to be the three versus the two, but that was sort of the only other question there. And sure. from the start of camp, it became very obvious that, that was going to be the situation. Um, kind of break it up with the lefty in the middle. We'll yeah. see if there's a lefty on the back end with with t- Tommy Henry or if they just roll with Ryan Nelson or Bryce Jarvis potentially as a dark horse. But um, getting to that sort of... Uh, spring cleaning, I guess, with some Diamondback stuff. They're going to have to pick a roster here in the next week or so. Yep. And they narrowed it down in the past uh, couple of days. Yesterday, on Monday, they optioned Slate Ciccone, Blake Walston, Corbin Martin. So what does that tell us about sort of where they are as far as the roster construction? For Martin, it's pretty simple. He missed the entirety of the 2023 season. He needs more reps to kind of build out and be able to be that multiple inning reliever who they want him to be. Needs a little more time exactly. against lesser competition, not to diminish AAA, of course, because it is a tough division to yeah. pitch in or a tough league to pitch in, especially Pacific Coast. But let him make mistakes. There, exactly. Kind of thing, yeah. Make your make your little screw ups or make your little tweaks, make your changes, make your adjustments down at the AAA level. And then because I've heard nothing but great things about Corbin during the spring and nothing but high praise from the manager, Tori Lovello, mm-hmm. about Corbin. So I expect that he's going to be an important piece for this team, maybe not in the first couple of months of the season, but maybe down the stretch run when the rosters expand just a little bit in the uh, latter months of the season. Yeah, just options are good, and he's going uh-huh. to be one for them. Um, Sacconi, that's the interesting one, right? Because he's the one, we kind of saw it as like a top four. There were other guys potentially in the mix there, but is it going to be Nelson, Henry, Sacconi, or Jarvis? And mm-hmm. Sacconi's the first one to go down and Tori Labello has injured. he didn't necessarily commit to him being a full-time starter down there or a reliever he's he, he kind of explained it as bulk innings hmm. so kind of maybe that can give you multiple innings out of the bullpen maybe somebody whom they can feel comfortable with you know being able to get you three they want him as at like any point flex option or I guess so if they are considering like a bullpen game per se he would get Maybe not the first inning, but he would get like two, three, four, five or two, three, four necessarily. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they're going to manage it. They're still having conversations about it. But the fact they're kind of thinking about him as more of a versatile piece versus, you know, a bona fide starting depth, like what Blake Walston is going to be down there. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we'll see what kind of progression they get out of Christian Mana uh, or Christian Mana out of, you know, in his first season with the organization. And um, maybe whomever doesn't get the fifth starter spot, one of those guys will certainly be starting depth uh down in reno so it's it's interesting to see exactly what they think 
uh, Sakoni's role is going to be is somebody that they feel like struggles to get through the order enough times mm-hmm. to be, you know, in the starting rotation in the major leagues at this point. So what can possibly change? I that? think at the same time, too, there was so much praise given to this team's bullpen during the month of September and October, right? Because it was one of the bigger catalysts and one of the bigger reasons as to why they got as far as they did in the World Series. You would hope for consistency. We expect consistency, especially from the latter three with Thompson, Ginkle, and Seawald. But what happens if, say, like a Scott McGuff, for example, or an Andrew Saul Frank, they start to struggle and they start to have issues with command and keeping guys off base? Well, then maybe you can turn to a Slade Ciccone, who's had some experience at the lower levels working out of relief, working in bulk, and it just gives you another option out of the pen because we know they're not going to have Dre Jameson for this year. Mm -hmm. But having Slade learn in a different role that is not just starter allows this major league roster to be flexible with him should there be a time to call him up. Yeah, definitely something to watch. And now we're down to three. Mm -hmm. Nelson with Jarvis and with Tommy Henry. So Not too surprised that Nelson and Henry got this far. I'm surprised more so that Jarvis got it the edge necessarily over Ciccone. I don't know if he's going to get the edge over Nelson or Henry, but it is encouraging, I will say, to see Bryce getting to this point in the spring without a decision being made by the front office on his uh, designation. Right. I mean, they they converted him into a reliever last year. The idea was to stretch him back out into a starter the spring. You know, maybe, you know, he's also competing for the fifth spot in the, spot in the rotation, but maybe he's also competing for a long relief role in the right. bullpen, which is something that they might need early on, especially as guys continue to get their pitch counts kind up. Kind of and what they did with Ryan and Dre last year, where they kept both, but they ended up with Dre was in the bullpen and Ryan got the fifth spot, maybe something like that. Yeah, but I wouldn't anticipate it would be exactly how they used Dre, just because, and, and Tori Lavello's been open about the use, how they used Dre, they thought, they thought may have contributed to him getting injured by Fair. having him stretch back out during the season. That's not something they necessarily not, want to it's do. It's not healthy. It's too much on the elbow yeah. and the shoulder as far as changing how much you throw in a given time period. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, and then the Blake Walson of it all, he's just, he's there for mm-hmm. depth. He was there last year. Um, still still has one of their top to prospects, you know, like give I mean, him the time to develop, I would say. Yeah. I mean, last year was kind of interesting year because he kept the runs down Mm -hmm. in Reno, which is good, but the strikeouts and walks were like pretty much neck and neck, which is not good. So uh, he's only 22 still. We'll we'll see what another year there potentially can bring out of that. Um, As I mentioned, Gallon versus Freeland. This will be Zach Gallon's first time starting on opening day at Chase Field. Um, Last year he was the opening day starter, but it was at Dodger Stadium. And before him, Madison Bumgarner was sort of the designated opening day starter for Mm -hmm. a few years. So uh, that'll be kind of a a neat thing that he hasn't been able to do. He pitched in their last game at Chase Field, and now he's going to pitch in their first game at Chase Field. And of course we expect a win. Because they're playing the Rockies. Well, right. Yeah, we'll see. They, they get they get Kyle Freeland, who they have plenty of experience. Yes. With. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the latest in Diamondbacks camp. It's it's a lot of we we still have some races for backup catcher and backup shortstop. I mean, it's sort of the point of it's so nice to or it's very like a fortunate position to be in where they have a lot of tough decisions, but they're all kind of more along the margins than like who the heck is going to be our everyday shortstop kind of a thing. The luxury of depth, I think, is a lot more evident with this year's team than it was in some of the teams of years past. Like, I was thinking about it today. When was the last time I felt very confident about a roster, at least on paper, heading into a season? Funny enough, it was 2020. When they mm. went out and they got Starling Marte to fill in center, they got Cole Calhoun to fit in right, they moved Cattell permanently to second base, they added Madison Bumgarner to the rotation. Like, all of the moves that they made in the offseason set them up as, okay, this team's got depth, this team has a, filled every single position on the field. And then, of course, the product that resulted on the field that didn't turn out so well. This is the best I felt about a Diamondbacks roster on paper since that point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you talk about depth and going to try to, like, do a little. St- I, I was going to use that to kind of transition into going into the NL West. <laughs> but then you brought up Cole Calhoun. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's another point. He Cole retired. Calhoun announced his retirement this this week. Former uh, Sun Devil over and weekend. former D-back. Yeah. Works up. Very good career. Yes. Excellent career with the, with the Angels for a long time. Gold Glover out there. Quality at bat. I mean, he's. Very good career, and so um, definitely not somebody to forget. But let's get into the National League West because uh, glad we're doing this today and not yesterday, or else we <laughs> wouldn't have a Blake Snell sized <laughs> hole to get to. Um, just in the past week, Blake Snell and Dylan Cease have joined this division, and it's a division that when you look at the top four teams in it, 
I mean, there's very good arguments for four playoff teams, potentially. 100%. Um, and just kind of going over who was added to this division. Let's kind of like list it off quickly. The Dodgers add Shohei Otani. They add Yoshinobu Yamamoto. They add Tyler Glass now, James Paxton. They bring back Clayton Kershaw, who will be not be ready in the first half of the season. Um, they bring in Teoscar Hernandez. They bring back Jason Hayward and Kike Hernandez. Walker Bueller will be back uh, after missing last season to Tommy John. Uh, Gavin Lux is back after he missed all of last season. Then you go to the Diamondbacks, who we've talked about. Eduardo Rodriguez, Eugenio Suarez, Jock Peterson. They bring back Lourdes Scurriel Jr. Randall Gritchick is there now. Uh, the Giants, they just signed Blake Snell. Um, <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's a top two rotation that we're, we'll get into. But man, that is, Logan Webb, Blake Snell is insane as your top two. It is nuts for them to be able to start the year with that duo, especially both of them coming off of Cy Young campaigns this past season. Not only that, the number one and the number two in Literally. both get. In the boat getters in the Cy Young. But then they also add Matt Chapman, Jorge Soler, Jung Hoo Lee, um, Jordan Hicks, Robbie Ray, Tom Murphy, and uh, old friend Nick Ahmed. And they hired Bob Melvin as their new manager. They hired too, Bob Melvin as their new manager. After Gab- firing Gabe Kapler, excuse me. And that, I think, is another factor that's going to play into how different this division could play out. Absolutely. And speaking of new managers, he mm-hmm. goes from the Padres to the Giants. The Padres bring in Mike Schilt, for, who used to be the manager of the Cardinals. Uh, Padres, a lot, you know, a lot of names leaving the organization, like Juan Soto and yeah. uh, Blake Snell, obviously, Trent Michael Grisham Waka. out of the outfield as well. Yeah, and uh, Josh Hader. They basically lose their best hitter, pitcher, and relief pitcher. Uh, but they still have a ton of talent. They still bring in Dylan Cease. Michael King comes over after a really good second half of the season last year. They add some bullpen guys like Yuki Matsui and Wusuko and um, some guys who hadn't pitched in the major leagues yet, but who have some decent upside. So yes. that's just kind of a, a running list of who's in this division. What did the Rockies do, Alex? I'm uh, just kidding. You they, added, <laughs> they added They added. Cal Quantrill, who I think is a good buy-low candidate, and they added Dakota Hudson kind of similarly. Uh, they didn't really spend any money in, in free no. agency, but that's kind of how they've done their business the last few years. They've operated that way for quite a while. Exactly. And and now as soon as we finish this, like J.D. Martinez will be on the on the Padres <laughs> or something like that. Maybe Jordan Montgomery will, will slide into somewhere. <laughs> Uh, Who knows? Maybe the Diamondbacks like, ugh, everybody's getting pitchers. Maybe Michael Lorenzen's like, that's just speculation. But yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's it's just anybody can be in the National League West, apparently. So I figure let's go team by team a little bit and kind of break down what is the biggest question you have about them going into the season. Sure. One player to look for, one pitcher to look for, move on to the next team. So Absolutely. for the Dodgers, it's sort of interesting for them because really the only question, it doesn't matter what the regular season does for them as we've seen the last three years apparently. yeah my question is what does the rotation look like in october because when you look at what they were i mean they were embarrassed by the diamondbacks last year mm-hmm. i mean clayton kershaw bobby miller not great those first two starts and then it just really went downhill Lance that Lynn one in a inning die game three that the one dude who's prone to give up so many home runs gave up four in one in inning i will never forget gabby moreno's two home runs and one at bat <laughs> that was so um, great so now you look at that in contrast versus what they could potentially have in the postseason this year, and that's before Shohei Otani is ready to go. Mm-hmm. Because if that's fully healthy, which we do not know if it will be fully healthy by then, who knows who will be up, who will be down, it could be like if it's a three game series, it could be Glass now, Yamamoto, and Bueller with Kershaw as a fourth option potentially, but you could also have. Gavin Stone is a fourth option, James Paxton, if Dustin May is healthy, like they have a lot of guys who could potentially be there. So for me, it's just like, what does that look like? And is it kind of more foolproof than what they've had in recent seasons? Well, we the recurring thing with the Dodgers always seems to be spend the money, spend the money, spend the money, at least when Andrew Friedman took over as the head of baseball ops. This team, though, has only seen the success of spending that money the one time and it was the shortest season of them all in the last, or in this part of the uh, 2020s. Can they spend all of this money, and to your point, it actually become fruitful in the games that matter, right? Can we? Can yeah, but we this pen- is extreme. Like, this is more than they've had. This is a sure, billion dollars. Sure, this is, I kind of see this as the, this is Dave Roberts' last chance to actually get this team at least into the World Series, back to the World Series, and then winning it all. And if they do anything less than that, my bold prediction is that Dave Roberts is gone. Hmm. Like, I don't think that this organization is going to be comfortable with the idea of spending as much money as they are or then will be long after Shohei Otani is done playing. And it just to result in a first round exit 
again. I don't think that they're going to be happy with 100 wins and a first round exit. So have they built a foolproof team? I'm curious about their defense and their lineup on a day to day basis, because you and I can agree that their top four is probably the one of the nastiest in baseball. Mm -hmm. Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, Freddie Freeman, Will Smith. That's a pretty damn good top four. What's after it, though, is Max Muncy, who had one of his worst batting average seasons last year. Jason Hayward, who's an aging veteran and still has upside defense, but the offense has been on the downturn. Teoscar Hernandez, who I like as a nice little piece to add in. He's got some speed. He's got some pop. As you noted, he's close to 100 home runs in his last three seasons. Gavin Lux, though, has been a very interesting storyline to watch in spring because he was set to be their opening day shortstop with Mookie at second base. And then they swapped the two for defensive reasons. And now Gavin looks like he's got the yips even from second base, just from highlights that I've been watching. I'm very curious to see how the lineup after one, two, three, four mm -hmm. pans out for them. And then doubly so their defense. Like, I'm not worried about Mookie at short. I know many people could be or should be. I'm worried more about Gavin Lux, Jason Hayward, James Altman, and Teoscar Hernandez in that outfield. And with bringing the Diamondbacks into this, with their speed and their ability to find the gaps when they hit the ball into the outfield, that could be an absolute nightmare for this Dodgers team, just as one example of an opponent they would face. So is Gavin Lux your player to watch, you think, for position player-wise? I think so, just because I'm curious as to whether or not he's going to fight the yips, per se. Uh, if I had to do a secondary one, I think Teoscar Hernandez is the one mm -hmm. that I want to watch, see if he can have... I mean, they're only paying him $2 million and deferring the other, what, 26 But... Uh, he had kind of a down year with Seattle in comparison to his all-star campaign in Toronto. So I'm curious to see if he gives them the Toronto Tay Oscar as opposed to what Seattle got from Tay Oscar. Yeah, Seattle's a tough place to hit. Um, LA is not the easiest place to hit, but he's going to have a lot more protection in the lineup. Uh, yeah, for me, you know, it's obvious to go with Shohei Otani, but you kind of have to you know, address the elephant in the room mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, they added the MVP to a team that had two top three MVP finishers last year in their lineup. So I guess like the big question is, is this team foolproof? It's kind of impossible in baseball to be that. But um, I, I think just the pitching absolutely scares the bejesus out of me when you look at the potential options for what they could have. I think you can in also a short series. You could also pen it as an overreaction to all of the pitching injuries that they had last year. Yeah. Like the only reason that we know about Gavin Stone and Emmett Sheehan is because they were kind of pressed into duty like around, what was it, May or June was when During they had the to season, be During the season, yeah, they yeah, came up. They had to be pressed into duty early. What the Dodgers did in the offseason was almost over-preparing for what could come because James Paxton, Paxton's coming off of injuries when he was with Boston. Yoshinobu Yamamoto, we don't know how he's going to pitch at the major league level. It's slightly different than pitching in Japan. We know he's super talented. We know he does a lot of yoga because he stays loose and limber. <laughs> but... It's a lot of guys that have been dealing with injury history. Tyler Glass now coming off of a season or near season ending injury, right? Like, yeah, they, it's almost an over preparation of what could happen for this rotation. Yeah. And that's probably what they needed to do if they want to get to that 100%. next level at this point. Um, I was going to go in reverse order of record from last year. Let's save the Diamondbacks for last. Sure. Uh, keep people on the hook a little bit. Let's uh, <laughs> let's go with the Padres because uh, this is a fascinating team. So San Diego you know, obviously their owner passes away at the end of last season, Peter mm -hmm. Seidler. And it's just a different way of going about their business this off season yes. by letting a lot of their guys go trading away Juan Soto, but you still look at it and it's still a lineup with Tatis, Cronenworth, Machado, Hassan Kim, Xander Bogarts. We'll see what they get out of Jackson Merrill, their top prospect who's going to be playing center field, even though he's an infielder. Mm -hmm. um, they still could use an outfielder. I know Bob Nightingale reported that they are tied to Tommy Pham. That would be another name that could enter, who could enter the division again, mm -hmm. which would be kind of funny given his back and forth with Padres fans last year when he was with the Diamondbacks. <laughs> um, but that he would help them. Certainly he would help them. And 100%. their rotation, now that they have Dylan Cease, it's Darvish, it's Musgrove, it's Cease, it's Michael King. It's still a talented team. Still a very talented team. And they had about as poor fortune as you can in hmm. late games. Yes, um, I saw the stats. That's incredible. Many of which is by their own doing, but also that's the kind of stuff that can vary from season to season and, you know, one run games and um, getting the record up. I mean, they were nine and 23 in one run games, two and 12 in the extra in extra innings. That's probably not going to happen again. I mean, that's huge for a team that finished with 82 wins last year. Yeah, it like cost how, them a postseason spot. How different would a lot of those 
games be if they'd have won those? And how, how would the Padres be seen differently? Like if they had the 84 wins that the Diamondbacks did last year, as opposed to the 82 that they did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of change here. My question for them is, can Fernando Tatis Jr. get to MVP level again? At this point, Can we you play we a full season it. without interruption of uh, right. varying different reasons, as we've seen in the past couple of years. And he did once he came back last year, but obviously it wasn't a full season, but he still was a five and a half win player. The offense wasn't quite as dominant as we've seen before mm-hmm. that gigantic absence. He didn't play in 2022 um, injury slash PED suspension. So but he was amazing defensively out in right field. Yes. So. Which is incredible coming from the shortstop position, too. Yeah, I mean, they have like shortstops just playing in the outfield, I guess, <laughs> with Jackson Merrill, too, and it's Jerks and Profar, too. If he's sort of like MVP candidate Fernando Tatis Jr., that makes that just ups their ceiling a lot, in my opinion, versus if he's a good hitter and it's a lineup that's top heavy with some good hitting, but there's not like that, like one guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess like my scope is like okay what kind of version of fernando tatis are we gonna get because he's still very young he's like 25 i think i'll tell you what i was trying to figure out what question i have about this padres team and it immediately came to me when you brought up the nine and 23 and one run games and two and 12 and extra innings last year one of the biggest pieces they lost in free agency was josh Hader, Mm -hmm. and this bullpen if that was the struggle that they had last year was one run games and extra inning games that means there's a lot of reliance on the bullpen this year right now, they made some additions, and this will be like my tandem pitchers to watch, I guess. Yuki Matsui and Wu Sako. I'm very curious to see what they can provide for this team's bullpen, if they could play off of each other as like the late inning guys. And I don't know who their closers are going to be. I Probably would, Suarez. I would think Robert Suarez, right? But, you know, who if Yuki pitches well enough or if Wu pitches well enough, they even got Wandy Peralta from the Yankees, who had pitched pretty well in the mm-hmm. last couple of years. I'm very curious to see how a team that really struggled in one runs and extra innings handles their bullpen. And having Mike Schilt at the helm is going to help with this a lot. I don't think like Bob Melvin's totally at fault for how they performed in those one run and extra inning games. But Mike Schilt, Mike Schilt has had great success as a manager with the St. Louis Cardinals. And I think that's only going to carry with this team. But how is it going to work when the innings get later and later and later with not really a clear establishment of who's going to take the ball in the late innings. Yeah, it's a, it's a different voice. It's a mm-hmm. different voice, a different leadership group. There's, um, it, It's just different. It's just going to be a different vibe of a team than, than they were the last couple of seasons when they had some really high highs and then last year kind of came crashing down. They got hot at the end, just kind of ran out of time to catch up in the wild card race. Yeah. So, yeah, but man, it's just like this team could still be really good, but they could also be an 82 win team again like I could see both parties how different did you feel about the Padres before they acquired Cease and after because the more I think about it the after Cease acquisition I'm like holy crap this team might actually be good like bet like way better than they were when they were in the playoffs in 2022 it just eliminates some questions it just eliminates some questions because how it was going is like top heavy and then which young guys are going to stick Mm -hmm. you know both in the lineup and in the rotation at the bottom of it uh, now there's less of those questions because you have somebody who could potentially be an ace for them. Last year wasn't great for Cease, but no. and he's again it's kind of like the Snell thing where getting deep into games, walking guys like that's going to be kind of a similar experience. Yeah. But now he gets to pitch in San Diego instead of in Chicago. Huge it's, park differential. You know, bigger games that are going to mean more. Mm-hmm. It's it's going to be a little bit of a different environment he's for him. He's also got an offense behind him that can actually produce a good amount of runs on yeah. a daily basis. So, uh he he's my he's my pitcher to watch. So, that's for pretty obvious reasons. Um let's keep it rolling. Okay. Let's go to the Giants. Team near and dear to your heart. <laughs> what did they do yesterday, Alex? They signed Blake Snell. Oof, man. To a 2-year contract, but although he could get an out after the first season huge um average annual value of course that that seems to be a recurring trend when free agents of this caliber are signed this late in the offseason he's getting like 62 over two but as you mentioned the opt-out uh and i think they've actually i read somewhere they pushed the signing bonus mm-hmm. into 2026 so he's only going to make 17 or 15 million dollars this year it's been a big off season for money managers yeah <laughs> seriously <laughs> i feel bad for all of the uh, financial advisors out there in the uh California area because they've had they've been busy this offseason yeah. to your point the Giants should be much more dangerous than last year they won 79 games last year to finish in fourth place in this division and a big reason why is just a lack of punch 
and inconsistency yeah that's true the day and day and not having i think the biggest thing that they addressed in the offseason is finding a way to have a consistent lineup day in and day out which they did not have whatsoever last year this and the additions that they made have very much set them up to have a day in day out lineup that is far better than anything that they've had this uh in the 2020s, I should say. Absolutely. I mean, they were bottom 10 in runs and mm-hmm. OPS and strikeout percentages. They didn't get guys on base nope. all that well. Their lead home run hitter was Wilmer Flores with 23. I think the Diamondbacks, Wilmer, former Diamondback. <laughs> very good player. Very useful player, Wilmer Flores. Mm-hmm. But I think the Diamondbacks had four players with more than 23 home runs yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, so you add Matt Chapman and Jorge Soler, jung Hu Lee, like we mentioned, to that. I mean, it just... Lee is fascinating to me. He's my player to watch for this season. Yes. Really good bat to ball skills. He's going to be their center fielder. Um, somebody who, you know, I watched earlier the spring training against Ryan Nelson hit 110 mile an hour home run. Yeah. Um, which was just an absolute laser beam. He has that pop and he is very good at getting on base. He's exactly what they need in front of guys who are going to provide some power. Because in Korea, he did not strike out really at all. No. He walked a ton. So is a very smart hitter who you're adding in front of somebody like Jorge Soler who can drive him in, which is just different than what they've had last year. I think at the same time, too, so they've addressed the biggest need, which was setting up a lineup that's day in, day out, going to have at least four of the same guys in it. I would think jung Hu Lee, Jorge Soler, Matt Chapman, and let's throw in Tyro Estrada are probably going to be in the lineup every single day, mm-hmm. if not 150 out of the, six, the 162. The pitching rotation. I'm very curious to see how this turns out. Not so much Logan Webb or Blake Snell. They're stretching out Jordan Hicks, and they gave him a four-year contract as well. So they're they're pop committed to this plan of having Jordan Hicks as a starter. And then, without Robbie Ray healthy, without Alex Cobb healthy, who are, as you mentioned, a former Cy Young winner and a former but, All-Star. But they'll, they'll be in there eventually. They'll be in there eventually, but they still need to get to that point where they've established enough in games without them that they can be the scary competitive team, as you mentioned, leading into this little bit. And Keaton Wynn has not had a ton of experience at the major league level, but it helps now that he has less pressure on him with Blake Snell at the top Mm -hmm. of the rotation. And then Kyle Harrison, who they're very high on, of course, got a little bit of a look at him in the major league level last year. It's still a challenge with, like you mentioned with Blake Walston, strikeouts to walks. It can be very erratic or it can be very successful. And sometimes it's a little more erratic than it is successful, but they're hoping to get the consistency out of Harrison because he, they have a lot of high hopes in uh, what he can do this year. I mean, he's considered the top left-handed pitching prospect in the league at yes. this point. And he got his feet wet a little bit in the major leagues last year. But I think adding Snell now, it takes a lot off of Harrison to be like the number two because mm-hmm. Harrison is the number two. Hicks joining a rotation in the major leagues after years as a reliever as the, like the number three it just it's like how can they kind of hold on until yes. Cobb and Ray come back now you have like too many guys once <laughs> like Cobb and Ray come back like if you have a rotation of Webb Snell Cobb Harrison and Ray does Hicks go back in the bullpen and become sort of your lockdown eighth inning guy before mm. Camilo Doval interesting is you know was he the seventh inning guy with Rogers and then Do- one of the Rogers is and then yeah. Doval so it just they have a lot more depth um, with the pitching than they had at this point last season with some mm-hmm. of the moves they made. Going out and getting Robbie Ray is interesting instead of you know it's sort of a taking away a financial burden from Seattle. But they at did the same a lot time, of bad contract swapping this offseason. Absolutely, <laughs> but at the same time, and Re- Diamondbacks fans know Robbie Ray. Yes, year in year out, it can vary a little bit. But with him at his best, if he's their fifth starter in the second half of the season. Um, they're just a lot more interesting. And so it's another team that there are certain questions, again, similar to the Padres. It's like, and a little bit to what your point about the Dodgers, the bottom half of the lineup, what mm-hmm. exactly will it look like? Yeah. It seems like Nick Ahmed's going to be their shortstop Which to start the season. Crazy that it has turned out this way in the spring. Because they let go Brandon Crawford, mm-hmm. hoping that, like, I guess Marco Luciano would be the guy. He just Doesn't might not be that ready. Doesn't appear that way. The defense a really is still tough needs spring. some work. The offense, as you have mentioned, it's a lot of strikeouts. Like he hasn't gotten to the point where they're comfortable in saying, "Yep, he's the guy." Whereas Nick Ahmed has absolutely done awesome in the spring. Granted, it's the spring. You sometimes <laughs> face a lot of lesser competition later in the games. Yeah, but the fact that he has a he has a very high chance of making this roster is just like props to Nick for being able to fight his way back onto a major league team. Absolutely, as a non-roster invitee, too. Yeah. So he's still technically not on the active roster, but he's so going you, to be. So are you going to 
So are we safe to say that Pablo Sandoval is probably not going to make the opening day roster for them? I wouldn't think so. I, I, I get the nostalgia bit, but at the same time, um, it seemed a little silly to consider him a viable major leaguer at this point in his career. And yeah. I, I, you know, very small sample size. I watched the Giants Diamondbacks play a couple of times this spring mm-hmm. and he played in those games. It didn't look great. No. So especially if he's yeah. only going to DH, like you got to do at least the one thing and he's not doing that right now. Yeah. Bottom of the lineup, Patrick Bailey, very, very good defensive catcher. Mm-hmm. We'll see if he can hit. Yes. Last year wasn't amazing offensively. It was good for a month, and then, yeah. oh, man, he wore out. They brought first. in Tom Murphy, I like, as sort of a compliment to me him. Me too. That makes a lot of sense to me, but, you know, their ceiling is higher if Patrick Bailey can hit a little bit. 100%. That's going to be a question. And then sort of bringing back the guys who were in the outfield last year, like Yastrzemski and Conforto, Austin Slater, like... Mm-hmm. Is that group like deep enough to keep them afloat on the bottom half of that lineup with the guys up top who are joining it? So, and and, and obviously, we don't know exactly with Matt Chapman. He's been a very good hitter throughout his entire career. The second half of last season was really bad, but he's really hasn't had a stretch like that ever. No. Now he's back in the Bay Area. He's back with Bob Melvin. He's maybe a little bit less pressure on him out of Toronto. I, I'm not maybe, entirely sure. Yeah, but, maybe Bob and yeah. even Matt Williams can find something in. Chapman that re-unlocks his power stroke that he showed in the month of April for Toronto this past year. I mean, a lot of his peripherals weren't that different from years past. So if you're getting an elite defensive third baseman with a 115 OPS plus or so, that's pretty good. And if nothing else, the Giants had needed to improve their defense dramatically. Last year, they were one of the worst defensive teams, infield and outfield for that matter. And it wasn't until Bailey came up that they started to actually coalesce a lot better. But not having to think about J.D. Davis at third base, or even if they had to put Wilmer Flores over at third base, Matt Chapman is immediately like an extra three wins defensively alone for them. I still have questions about a lot of their defense, but yes, the left side, Bailey at catcher, it should be much better. Yes. It should be much better. Uh, Last one here before we get into how Arizona kind of stacks up into all this. I think Mm -hmm. that's a good way to phrase what we talk about the Diamondbacks, but... Let's go to the Rockies. I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on the Rockies because they didn't do a whole lot this offseason. I just laugh because your reasons for optimism section in your piece on ArizonaSports.com starts with exactly how a lot of people should feel about the Rockies. Well, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, that's exactly how we should feel about the Colorado Rockies. And I'd be shocked if they get back to the 59 win mark that they got to last year especially in this division. Granted, they don't play the same amount of games, as Mm. you pointed out. It's a lot less. But you're also playing a lot of the American League team, or all of the American League teams, I should say. And the American League East is not going to be an easy division to go against this year. American League Central, you might have your way, but there's some sneaky talent on that side of the field. Like, I I don't see the Rockies doing much of anything other than selling at the deadline. And that's in end of July that we have to worry about that. I think they're a little better than they were last year. I certainly think they're a little better. What are you looking at? Health. Okay. Chris Bryant has not played many games for them since he signed that big contract. Mm -hmm. He's now at first base. He's had a healthy spring. He's looked pretty good. Brendan Rodgers has not been healthy really for the majority of his big league career. Missed all of last year. You know, looking up his numbers, this is going to be the sixth season in which he plays major league games. He, oh, he played sparingly his first couple seasons, just mm-hmm. as like cups of coffee. Yeah. But this will be the sixth season in which he will get major league reps, which is wild to me because I still think of him as being in like his second year. Right. But it's because injuries, have, he's, he was held to 46 games last year. He's looked great in the spring. Mm-hmm. Nolan Jones was very good for them when he came over from Cleveland. They brought back Charlie Blackman. It just feels like they have at least going into the season, as long as they do stay healthy, a bit more upside offensively. And this should be, I think the Diamondbacks are probably the best defensive team in this division. Mm -hmm. The Rockies could be second. Very good defensive outfield with uh, Brenton Doyle out there defending Gold Glover. Nolan Jones is far and away. Good on the corners. Good in the corners. Ezekiel Tovar at short, Ryan McMahon at third. We'll see what Chris Bryant looks like at Mm -hmm. first base over an extended period of time. But this should be a very, very good defensive team. But yeah, going back to your point, what exactly are the Rockies actually going to look like? They're just smothered in this division by everybody else. And a lot of the questions too will be, you know, what is the rotation? What does the bullpen look like? Mm -hmm. We mentioned Quantrill and Dakota Hudson. I like them as 
four raisers potentially, but if they're well, decent, they might get traded at the deadline. What's anyway. interesting is they could have been four and fives in this rotation, but they're without Antonio Sensatella, who's mm-hmm. going to miss year. most of the year. And then Herman Marquez recently uh, underwent Tommy John surgery, so he's going to be out for probably the whole season as well. So yeah. I'm curious how different this rotation would look if it was fully healthy to a point that you made in a tweet that you sent out last night. How does this look? If it's fully healthy, but we're not going to get that this year. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're going to get much out of this team because, yeah, the offense is always consistent enough. The offense plays in Coors Field. I've accepted that that's an actual thing now after living in Colorado forever. (laughs) But the pitching is not going to be able to keep up with the offense. And I don't see how this team can keep itself in games unless it's literally hitting its way out of it. And they, to your point, have to be fully healthy because two of the guys in the middle of that order... Chris Bryant and Brennan Rogers have not been healthy for this team. And the bottom of the order still leaves up a whole lot to be desired. Are they going to get all-star Elias Diaz, too? Like, he had flashes of power last year, but now he's probably going to be splitting a lot of time with Jacob Stallings because Diaz is minus defensively, whereas Stallings is a bit more of a plus. Didn't really see that in Miami, though. Did we, Jeremy? Um, But yeah, it's outside of the catcher position, which... It could go either way to your point about the defense and of course their ability to hit i just wonder if the pitching is going to be able to keep them in games i don't see it yeah i think we've talked too much about the rockies as it is um, that's a good point <laughs> I, I will say the one thing is who are the building blocks right mm-hmm. can rogers have that season where it's like okay this is somebody to build around can ezekiel tovar hit to the point where with his defense he's somebody to help build around can nolan jones keep it going that's the most important thing watching this rocky season who are the guys who are going to be part of the next good rockies team yeah um because it might it might it might be a while um a long it might be a while let's go to the diamondbacks so we talk about the division it's sort of like a sandwich a little bit the dodgers are win total wise probably way ahead of everybody as they were last year Mm -hmm. the rockies like they were last year way below everybody and then you have these middle teams, and I looked at the just just to kind of get like a visual. I looked at like the FanDuel win totals, mm-hmm. and I think it had the Diamondbacks uh, eighty three and a half, the Padres eighty three and a half, and the Giants eighty three and a half. So Oof. there's clearly some, you know, troubles outside looking in, mm-hmm. differentiating the teams. So looking at the Diamondbacks, what makes them different than the Padres and the Giants, who were two teams that add who have a lot of top-end talent but definitely are flawed. Uh, and I think a lot of it is defense and defensive soundness for the Diamondbacks, uh, being dynamic uh, as far as speed, winning on the bases, taking extra bases, and what we've seen as far as their uh, sort of mission to go out and add depth in maybe places that those other couple of teams don't have. But those other teams have some pretty good top and talent. So what do you think is sort of a differentiator from the Diamondbacks to get potentially a leg up I on think those other two? The biggest thing for me is the way that their core is supplemented. It's a youthful core. When we think about Corbin Carroll being the centerpiece of that, Gabby Moreno has clear, very clearly established himself as this team's catcher, right? Geraldo Perdomo's coming into his own as a shortstop. Cattell Marte's on the older end of this group, but he's still, when they brought him he in... Looked like he looked like all-star Cattell Exactly. Yeah. He was a big part of the growth of this team and even you can throw in Alec Thomas in that conversation you can throw in Jake McCarthy if he makes the roster Um, I think that the fact that this team is built around its younger players and that and that's just naming position players didn't even mention the pitchers that this team is built around its younger players sets them up a lot better for the years to come Mm -hmm. whereas I look at the Giants and the Padres outside of maybe Tatis and now with the Giants signing Jung-Hoo Lee what is the youth core that those two teams have that allow them to continue to be good year after year after year? The pieces around those two in particular are veterans on high-end contracts, right? Whereas the Diamondbacks, Corbin Carroll got his big contract, but he's still going to be with this team for a long while and is a big part of how this team is going to grow for the rest of this decade. Absolutely. It's a great point. It's a great point because we kind of look at this in windows, right? Like, what is the window here? Right. And for the Diamondbacks, that's sort of a loaded question a little bit just because, you know, Walker's in the last year of his contract. Zach Gallen and Merrill Kelly are only under team control for the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. What does that look like going forward? So, yeah, there's still sort of that level of urgency that they've built around. But you're right. It's a little bit different than some of the other teams in the division that we know these younger guys are going to be you know, potentially really good Arizona Diamondbacks for a really long time and they can continue to work around it. Um, 
yeah, the the Giants well, again. We'll see. We mentioned Luciano, but mm-hmm. we don't know. Um, Kyle Harrison maybe could be their ace of the future. I mean, they're trying we'll to bring up their young core. We saw a lot of the youthful guys come up last year, like Casey Schmidt and David VR. They gave them opportunities last year as mm-hmm. well. But it's the inconsistency. Whereas at least with this young core, you've gotten the consistency out of Moreno. You've gotten it out of Carroll. It is very much starting to come around for Brandon Fott. And Zach Gallen is looking like a regular ace, and he hasn't even hit age 30 yet. Yeah. Like, this team is set for the rest of the decade, whereas the other two the other two teams are kind of their pay each year by year. Like, th- think about it for next year. The Giants, who are they going to bring back? Are they going to have back Chapman? We don't know. Are they going to have back Snell? We don't know. They're guaranteed to have back Solaire and Lee, but Solaire is going to be middle 30s by the time next year rolls around. Like, the Diamondbacks are good for the rest of the decade with the team that they have. Potentially. That's, Potentially. That's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. The idea of this offseason after they won, they win 84 games, they get in the wild card, they go on this amazing run of the World Series. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, can they build a perennial postseason contender? Did they do enough to build a team that you are confident, okay, in late September, they're going to be playing meaningful games to get into the postseason. Maybe they'll already be in the postseason mm-hmm. and then go back into October. That's the goal here. And as far as sort of roughing out the edges, they have done a nice job of uplifting the floor of this team with Suarez at third base versus the platoon that they had last year with Rodriguez in the rotation and not Zach Davies or a group of youngsters. They've even got designated designated hitters. It's not just... <laughs> Uh, it's going to be you today, or it's going to be you today. No, it's going to be Chuck Peterson against the right-handers and Randall Gritchick when he's ready to go against yeah. the left-handers. Like They've addressed literally every position around the diamond and improved on each one. Absolutely. And there's still the questions. They were very healthy last year. Mm-hmm. We'll see how they can handle that if something happens. But uh, it, yeah, it does feel like when you look at the three teams, those are some of the differentiators for Arizona. It just it's It's a dynamic team. It's a young team. We'll see... Like now that they have sort of the expectations, this was kind of more of a theme early in camp when it's like the first time you see them. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, what is it going to look like now that you were no longer necessarily the underdog that nobody saw coming because you've already done the darn thing once. So can you do it again? How does how do they handle that? How do they handle lulls? Will it be similar to last year when you know they sunk pretty low for a while and then climbed back out of it? Um, will this bullpen that they're basically bringing back piece by piece from last year hold up the same so there's certainly tons of like questions but yeah when you're looking at like those three teams should be a bloodbath for for those potential wildcard spots assuming the dodgers win 100 games which is <laughs> kind of what they do every single year it's not just because they made all these moves it in, they've but... been doing this but um yeah we'll see and, and who knows maybe we get an unexpected run at the division at the dodgers that we didn't see coming that would be fabulous but just for a comp- competition standpoint. so But there's so much talent in this division. There's so many good teams. <laughs> it's probably the most balanced division in baseball at this point with just how many good teams there are. Mm-hmm. So um, it's going to be fascinating to see. I think, too, um, considering the offseason that the big four teams in this division have had, could you make an argument that everybody's chasing the Diamondbacks? Or is everybody trying to chase the Dodgers and go for the division? I argue that it should be looked at as everybody's chasing the Diamondbacks because they were in the World Series last year, obviously, right? The Dodgers, in response to being beat in three games in the NLDS, went out and spent the most money that any MLB team has ever spent in a single offseason. The Diamondbacks took a group that got to the World Series and made it better with offseason additions. The Padres seemingly looked like they were folding the folding their hand and pushing the chips in and folding their pushing their cards in excuse me (laughs) they don't want to push the chips in if they're folding um and then turn it around and now they've actually redesigned a team that could very much compete and get surpassed that 82 win total they got to last year Mm -hmm. and then of course the giants who had just fired their manager after a disappointing season i'm sure the front office is feeling the heat a little bit of not replicating the success of 2021 and they got aggressive and I wonder if teams are chasing the Diamondbacks because they see all we have to do is get to the postseason. Then it's anybody's game. And if we have the best team come postseason time, no matter what seed we're in, we could run the table. We could run the whole thing. We could do exactly what the Diamondbacks did. So I wonder how, like when we're talking about the Padres, Giants, and Diamondbacks in that sandwich of the division, I don't think it is they're trying to compete and chase the Dodgers for the division. 
I think they're just trying to best the Diamondbacks, get into the postseason, and then be the next team that makes the run. I'm going to put on my GM hat and give you the GM answer. I'm they're just trying to build the most well-rounded team. <laughs> Yeah, the, you're, you're, the you're Rangers right. you're, you too went it, on a wild card earlier. run. You mentioned it earlier. More wild card teams, fewer games in the division. The division still matters a ton. Obviously, you still play your division more than you yes. play everybody else. But with that opportunity there, if you can build a, ro- a, a roster that can get you 85 to 90 wins and give you a chance, mm-hmm. that's that's the most important thing at this point. So, 100%. Look, lots to get to with this division. We'll continue to talk about it because it'll be a really really interesting story all season long. Baseball is here. I may not go to bed before watching a baseball game that's technically a regular season game, even though it's still spring training. Although the Diamondbacks playing a night game tonight will make that a little bit more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but just take a nap back. during the day. That's what you got to do. Baseball is back. The <laughs> Fang podcast will be back. Thanks so much for tuning in and keep it on Arizona Sports for all things Diamondbacks.